what philosophy is in the Christian context, namely the handmade to theology, an entirely independent standing discipline, but one which in a Christian context is ordered to the same thing that theology is, namely to bring us into a greater knowledge of God through knowing the world that he has created. And so philosophy, like theology, uh, orders us to God and uh, helps us to attain happiness. Our speaker this evening has reminded us that when we speak on the Trinity, we should probably begin with prayer. So I will follow his uh, invitation to do that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of these days and the gift of your love revealed to us through your Son and in the Spirit. We ask you to love the truths we study this evening. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So tonight's speaker is Professor Lawrence Feingold who is Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at Kenrick Lennon Seminary of the Archdiocese of St. Louis. In the Paradiso, Dante has Bonaventure praise St. Dominic as one who almost from the moment of his baptism applied himself to becoming a theologian in the service of the Lord's vineyard. These words well describe our concluding speaker who upon receiving the gift of faith and baptism in 1989 while engaged in realist marble sculpture at Pietra Sancta in Tuscany, went on to study philosophy and theology at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome, writing a dissertation that quickly became known and admired by students of Aquinas throughout the world. The book version of this dissertation, entitled The Natural Desire to See God According to Thomas Aquinas and His Interpreters, is truly a monumental achievement. Professor Feingold is also author of the masterful three-volume study, The Mystery of Israel and the Church, which develops a Catholic theology of Israel and her unique mission in salvation history. Most recently, he has published the highly praised introduction, Faith Comes from What is Heard, an Introduction to Fundamental Theology. A true poet of creation and salvation, whose love of beauty is matched only by his thirst for truth, Professor Feingold's lecture is titled, The Word Breathes Forth Love, The Psychological Analogy of the Trinity and the Complementarity of Intellect and Will. Professor Feingold. Thank you so much. How can I live up to that introduction? And thanks for the invitation here. And it's been a wonderful conference. All right. So, um, so I was asked to speak on the Trinity, um, Trinity and the soul. And so I'd like to look at the psychological analogy for the Trinity from two directions. So we'll begin by going from, the, from us to God, um, looking at our, um, to understand the Trinitarian processions by analogy with our acts of um, knowing and loving. And then we'll turn it around in the second part of the talk and go from top down, um, looking at the exemplar of the Trinitarian processions to illuminate the complementarity of intellect and will, and in particular, with regard to the question about um, be the formal essence of beatitude. Is it the act of only one of our spiritual faculties, the intellect, as St. Thomas actually holds, um, or both um, in complementarity? And I will argue for the latter. Okay, um, so the, um, the psychological analogy um, developed above all by um, St. Augustine in his work on the Trinity and um, I think further perfected by St. Thomas Aquinas has its roots in Revelation. So it's not, simply, um, it's not simply from the bottom up, but it's from Revelation, it's really from the top down um, because Revelation um, gives us the names of the divine persons that suggest an association with the intellect for the second person of the Trinity, who is the logos, the word, um, and also called wisdom, right, which all suggest um, the intellectual operation, and the spirit, um, which is a name of, meaning impetus, breath, um, movement, um, is suggestive of the will. 
and the Spirit also has given other names, um, such as the gift. And we see that in the book of Acts um, numerous times. Um, the Spirit is spoken of as the gift with a capital G. Um, and also love, um, the Spirit who pours love into our hearts, um, as said in Romans. Um, suggesting again um, the operation of love and the, um, and the will. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, St. Thomas, when he goes in the, in the Summa to explain this analogy, he starts off with the remark that it's crucial to make a distinction between two kinds of actions that we do. Um, when we think of action, we tend to think of transitive action, where we make something outside of that results outside of our he- ourselves. We build a house, and it stands outside of ourselves. But there are also imminent actions in which the fruit or product remains interior, and we call those imminent operations for remaining interior. And um, it's crucial in seeking to make an analogy for the Trinity, that we choose imminent operations rather than transitive operations. Why? Well, Arius sought to understand the Trinity using the transitive operation of human reproduction, and the result being that the Son would be exterior to the Father, and thus, ultimately, not God. So St. Thomas explains that we have to use the analogy of imminent operations, um, and in and it, maybe in a different sort of way, Sibelius ran into the same kind of problem. Um, and um, we have, um, our senses are imminent to a certain extent. Um, they're transitive actions with regard to our, um, um, our sense um, organs, but then um, an imminence in the phantasm which remains inside. But the, most, the two perfectly imminent operations are intellect and will. Right? So those are the the two operations that serve for this analogy. And of course, um, since we have these two operations, it fits with the two processions um, that lead to the second and third person. So let's look at the, um, it's easier to understand the um, generation of the word than the spirit, right? So I'm gonna focus more on the procession of the spirit because of its greater difficulty. Um, with regard to the, um, the action of knowing, we all experience that when we know something, we form something interiorly, which we call the concept or idea, which is an interior word that is expressed in the act of knowing. And we speak it, and in that word that we speak interiorly, we see um, the object. We see the reality that we've come to know in that word. And so that interior word is an imminent fruit or product of the operation of knowing. Now, in our case, say, when we know ourselves, <clears throat> we produce a, a concept, which would be our self-knowledge, but that concept is very imperfect, right? Because it leaves out all sorts of things because it's abstract. Now, when God knows himself, he's going to say a perfect word that says all that he is. And therefore, that word leaves nothing out. And if it leaves nothing out, that word will be God, right? Because it differs in nothing from that which it says. And so it will be God from God. And thus, one in essence, substance, but distinct by relation, because it's God proceeding from God, which is precisely what we're looking for to understand the Trinity. Oneness in essence, but a distinction um, of relation. So God from God. And this, the word is also spoken of as the son, the son of God. And so we might ask, what, how does word and son go together? They seem like totally different but when we think about it, um, what do we call our, our concept? Clearly, the word concept has a relation to conceive. And so it seems that's not by chance because we engender, we bring forth our concepts interiorly. And um, generation involves um, bringing forth something by way of similarity. Right? Our concepts are meant to be images of what we see and know. Right? And so it's producing something um, with a similarity in nature. And so 
um, it makes sense that the word is also the son. And we use this analogy of generation. Right? And St. Thomas points out that um, scripture does this, calling him the son, but also in the wisdom texts of the Old Testament. So for example, Proverbs 8.24, the depths were not yet, and yet I was already conceived. And before the hills I was brought forth or born. Okay, so, let's, so I think that's easier to understand. It's always easier to think about thinking, I think, than about willing. Um, so maybe we'll have to sweat more as we um, think about the procession of the Spirit. Um, so the will, likewise, now I think when we often, so just to dispel a misapprehension, um, often when we think of willing, we tend to think of willpower and execution, and that obviously our will does lead to execution and thus to transitive activity. But before being a commanding faculty, the will is first an effective faculty because we would never command anything if we didn't first love something. Right? So the will first is um, a faculty that has an interior fruit of love and then because of that love, desire, joy, and then for the opposite, hate, aversion, um, sorrow. Um, and those, um, I'm sorry, um, we're changed by our operations of will, right? So when we love God, as opposed to not loving him, we are different, right? So there's an interior fruit, and that fruit is precisely an impetus to the beloved, right? That makes us different than if we didn't do it, right? And so we say that we carry our loved ones in our heart because of this imminent action of loving. And so our spouses accompany us to the conference, um, but not in the same way as our concepts, right? Our concepts um, are with us as similitudes, likenesses of what we know, but our loved ones as um, the term of an impetus of love. Um, and so St. Thomas, um, in speaking about this, um, says the operation of the will within ourselves involves another procession, that of love, whereby the object loved is in the lover. As by the conception of the word, the object spoken of or understood is in the intelligent agent. Hence, beside the procession of the word in God, there exists in him another procession called the procession of love. Right? And that's the breathing forth of the Holy Spirit. And he likewise explains that um, this is not called generation, right? And so they're not two sons. The interior fruit of the eternal um, act of divine love in God um, doesn't produce another son because um, the movement of love is not um, producing a likeness, but rather an impetus. And so the spirit is spoken of precisely with the word spirit in Revelation, which is, means precisely that, an impetus of love. Now, there's a difficulty here. And the difficulty is it's harder to see how this interior fruit of loving is a divine person than in the case of the intellect, it seems to me. Right? In the case of the intellect, we explain that that word is lacking in nothing and therefore can't not be God. This impetus, how is that a divine person? And <clears throat> this... Uh, so this is a difficulty, and I think we can be aided in this by introducing a distinction that St. Thomas makes elsewhere in the Summa later on in the Treatise on the Passions. He has a magnificent distinction between two aspects of love, which he calls love of concupiscence, or it could be called love of desire, or with the Greek term, maybe that's the best, eros, and then um, love of benevolence, or love of friendship, and there's the Greek term agape. And we shouldn't think of these as two different acts. Rather, we should think of them as two aspects of every act of love. Right? That's how St. Thomas introduces this. 
So he says, in every act of love, we will some good for someone. You can't, I mean, we can't think of what would be an act of love that didn't involve those two poles. Some good willed for someone, whether myself, my spouse, my family, my country, God. And so the aspect by which love is directed to some good is eros. And the aspect by which love is directed to a person for whom we will that good, we can call love of benevolence or agape. Right? So that's different than the way I think most people consider these two aspects of love. Right? We often think of them as simply two completely distinct acts rather than two aspects of every act. Um, and so this love of benevolence gets a special name, friendship, when it's a mutual um, love of benevolence between two lovers. Now, of these two kinds of love, St. Thomas asks, which one has the primacy, right? Whenever you have two things, you want to put them in order if you're a wise man. And so he says that of the two, it's agape that has the primacy um, because we will goods for the sake of persons. Right? And so the love of eros or desire is for the sake of the love of agape. Even if that is a self-love, right? So I'm willing, even in the highest things, take the, the love of, of hope, uh, love of desire, to heavenly beatitude for myself. Um, there too, we can distinguish those two aspects. Eros for happiness, perfect happiness, beatitude, and a person there. And then likewise, in charity, um, willing all things for the glory of God, um, the agape for God. All right, so love of benevolence has a primacy. Um, and here's the, the key text of St. Thomas is from the Prima Secunde, question 26, article four. Um, to love is to wish good to someone. And so hence there's this twofold tendency towards the good which a man wishes to someone, himself or another, and towards that to which he wishes some good or to whom he wishes, uh, I'm sorry, that to which he, uh, right, to, to whom he wishes some good, sorry. Accordingly, man has love of concupiscence towards the good that he wishes and love of benevolence towards him to whom he wishes the good. All right, so let's apply this now to the um, procession of the Holy Spirit. The, the eternal act of love, how should we consider it, eros or agape? All right, if you put the question like that, it's a no-brainer. It's clearly, we should think of it as agape. In other words, a love directed to a person which is, has the primacy. And that'll be important um, in a few minutes. Um, and I think that makes it easier to see how um, the act of love in God produces a divine person. Now, um, and so I want to introduce the notion of self-gift here. Right? So there was a, one of the breakout sections had a, a talk on this as well. Um, and so John Paul II has put that notion, self-gift, front and center in countless uh, addresses and, and his uh, Wednesday audiences. And I think that's how we should think of this impetus of love in God, which is um, the movement of agape. So in human life, um, love of friendship involves giving many things to our friend, but above all, ourselves, right? That's the, St. Thomas speaks of that as the first gift, love for the other by which we will him good and in, the good of ourselves is the first gift that motivates all the other gifts. And so we can speak here of a self-gift. And the best analogy is in marriage where um, that total friendship, that marriage is the spouses give themselves totally to one another. And so that's how I think we should think of this impetus, an impetus of self-gift to the beloved and it would be of the father to the son and the son to the father with one love. Right? Because it's, there could be nothing distinguishing that one love. Right? So an, a perfect impetus of self-gift, and that self-gift will not be lacking anything. All right. So when I, tragically, when I love my wife with an impetus of self-gift, some things, despite our intentions, are going to be lacking. It's not going to be a perfect love. But in God, it's going to be perfect and total. Nothing would be lacking. How could that impetus not be God. Okay, that's the argument. I think that helps in understanding the, uh, the procession of the Holy Spirit.
And St. Thomas, he doesn't directly use the term self-gift, but he does speak in a way that suggests it. He has a magnificent question. It's question 38 in the Treatise on the Trinity in which he um, examines the, the name gift as a proper name for the third person of the Trinity. And in it, he says, we give something to anyone gratuitously inasmuch as we wish him well. So what we first give him is the love whereby we wish him well. Hence it is manifest that love has the nature of a first gift through which all other free gifts are given. So since the Holy Spirit precedes as love, he precedes as the first gift. And so I think that can be easily uh, understood in terms of self-gift. Um, and in this way, the, he also speaks of the procession of the Holy Spirit as a mutual gift, a mutual gift that is the bond of unity between the Father and the Son. Right? And so um, agape, precisely as an interpersonal love, presupposes the constitution already of two persons. Right? And that's, there's an order in the Trinity. Right? So I'd like to look at that now for a minute. Um, we can see the, so how does the psychological analogy help us in distinguishing? We said we don't have two sons Right? because the procession of love is distinct from knowing. And in, not just distinct, but perfectly complementary. An opposite direction, as it were. In knowing, um, the movement is um, bringing into one, right? the, um, um, whereas the movement of love is to the beloved. And so they're complementary movements, so clearly distinct. And then there's an order. And that order we can see in two ways. First, you can't love what you don't know. Right? And so we're not talking about chronological priority, but a logical priority. There's an order. And that's why we, for example, the um, baptismal formula in Matthew doesn't say the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, but in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? So there's an order of the, of the persons that follows the order of the processions. So you can't love what you, can't love what you don't know, um, the procession of love presupposes the procession according to knowledge. And then secondly, this agape love, interpersonal love, presupposes two persons. And so that likewise uh, works out. Okay. Um, now we can see from this that there's a beautiful circular movement engendered in the Trinitarian life, and that is fitting because the Trinitarian life is eternal life. And its movement is said analogically, right? So it's obviously it's a movement without any change. It's movement in the sense of perfect actuality of operation. And it's a circular operation in the sense that um, there's a going forth in generation by way of similitude and then a return to the source by way of impetus. And thus we can see it along the lines of exitus reditus um, today's Gospel, uh, tomorrow's gospel, the, the planting of the seed and its fruit that comes forth. Okay. All right, now, um, and we'll come back to that circularity when we look at human beatitude. Right? We should expect to see a parallel. Now, just one brief thing. The psychological analogy, very often I think the impression is given that it's something purely uh, metaphysical, um, but as we said, it's suggested by revelation and it's in profound harmony with salvation history. Right? When you think about the missions of the Son and the Spirit, they perfectly manifest the, um, the two processions that we've just been seeking to understand according to the psychological knowledge. Right? So the Word has a mission to reveal the Father. Right? Has the Word, how appropriate. And that mission, so first to reveal, but also to restore our sonship by restoring the likeness, because he is the likeness, right, as the word. Um, and so he speaks the word of revelation um, to restore our likeness, redeems us to restore that likeness, and his redemptive mission culminates in sending the spirit of love. Right? And so that, um, then that would be the invisible mission of the Holy Spirit. And so it's fitting that the Son's mission of revelation culminates with the sending of the Spirit at Pentecost. And it's necessary also for the likeness. We would have no likeness to the Son if we didn't also breathe forth love as the Son does. 
Right? So there's, and this could be obviously developed in much greater length. The, um, the harmony with salvation history or the economic trinity with what we've spoken about um, in the, um, the imminent processions. Okay, I'd like to move on now to part two, reversing the analogy and using the Trinitarian processions as the exemplar to illuminate our action, the complementarity of intellect and will and applying it to a particular problem, which is a much disputed problem, disputed, for example, um, by, between all the great scholastics, St. Bonaventure, St. Thomas, about um, Scotus, um, what act and what faculties act formally constitutes the essence of beatitude? Is it the act of the intellect in seeing God or the act of the will in, and there could be different possibilities there, loving God, delighting in him, um, or both together in complementary, right? And so different answers have been given. Uh, okay, so what, so our question is, how does the, um, Trinity, the psychological analogy for the Trinity and these two uh, processions that we've been looking at help to illuminate that problem? Well, the first thing that we can see is that in the Trinitarian life, um, we can, there is a priority, right? There's an order, we said. And so the procession according to intellect is first. And so in that sense, we can say there's a priority of intellect with respect to will. Can't love what you don't know. Um, but the... Um, procession of the spirit also has something proper to it. It finalizes, it consummates the movement in that circular fashion of return. And right? so it has a finalizing or consummating character. Um, and again, we said that the two directions are opposed. The, um, in the first procession, um, the second procession is from the first, and in the second procession, the father and son now become for one another through the spirit, the bond of unity. And so clearly we can't say there's one absolute priority in the Trinitarian life. That would um, be incompatible with the um, consubstantiality of the divine persons and the equal dignity of the two processions. So we should expect, using this analogy, that something similar should be the case in us. It would be fitting if, if there's a mirroring that in human life and particularly in beatitude, there ought to be a complementarity of intellect and will, which together would mirror the Trinitarian life. And that's what I'm going to argue. And we would expect St. Thomas to argue this because um, he lays down this principle. Um, and it's, it's a principle of exemplarity. He says, um, so this is from his commentary on the sentences in early work. He uses this Neoplatonic principle of return. Um, in the going forth of creatures from the first principle, he says, there is found a certain circular movement or return in that everything returns to its end in that from which it took its beginning. In other words, we should expect beatitude to mirror creation. That's the idea. And creation, though, was done through, and the, the exemplar of creation are the two processions. So he goes on to say that, thus it is necessary that the return to the end be through the principle from which it was brought forth. And what was the principle from which it was brought forth? Since the procession of the divine persons is the exemplar of the production of creatures by the first principle, so also the same procession, the two, the, right, the, the generation of the word and the breathing forth of the spirit, is the exemplar of their return to the end. So what the text, text suggests is that beatitude by which we return ought to be marked by a Trinitarian character in which there's a mirroring of the two Trinitarian processions. Right? That's what we would expect St. Thomas to argue. Oddly enough, though, he doesn't do so when he treats this directly, although there's a tension in his writings. I don't have the time to go through all the textual questions, but um, let's look at, so St. Thomas treats this question directly and expressly um, in, I'll pick the two most important texts, are the Summa Contra Gentiles, book three, chapter 26, and the Summa Theologiae Prima, uh, Prima Secundae, question three, article four, in the treatise on the final end. And he poses this question. Um, what essentially constitutes beatitude? And he makes an argument by elimination here. He says, well, 
Let's consider what acts it could be. On the part of the will, there are three acts by which the will is directed to the good. Love, desire, and joy or delight. And he will proceed to eliminate all three. And therefore, by elimination, it must be another faculty, the intellect, that essentially constitutes beatitude, seeing God. Right? That's the argument. Let's read it. It says, it is impossible for the act of desiring. So of these three, love, desire, and joy, first he rules out desire. Clearly, desire can't be what makes us blessed, right? Because we desire to get blessed, right? So that's, that's a no-brainer. So it's impossible for the act of desiring to be the ultimate end. For it is but desire that, we will, that the will tends towards what it does not yet possess. And then secondly, he eliminates love. So too, the act of loving cannot be the ultimate. For a good is loved not only when possessed, but also when not possessed. Because love precedes logically desire, right? We only desire something that we already love. And so when we first begin to love something, we don't yet have it. That's what leads to desire, to get it, and then to rest in it. And then he eliminates delight as well, because that's presupposing it's already been attained. We delight when we've already got that which we desire. Right? It seems like a good argument, the elimination. And he gives a couple analogies to help illuminate this. And, and one of them is a miser. Now, this is not... I'm, um, the psychological analogy was better, right? Because when you want to speak about high things, you want to pick high examples. And the example maybe of a miser and money is not the most apt. But anyway, St. Thomas does this. And um, so a covetous man who puts his end in wealth loves and desires money before he gets it, right? So clearly that love and that desire can't be what makes him blessed. It's going to be getting the money by some other faculty, right? By his hands and and intellect, etc., that getting that money, uh, that will make him happy. And then once he gets it, he'll rejoice in it, right? So that's, that's his analogy. And he, another analogy that he uses is local movement. Right? In local, so he distinguishes four things in movement. In every movement, we can see a tendency towards an end, right? A natural inclination. You wouldn't ever move if you didn't have some inclination to move. And then an actual desire and the acts by which we move, um, so the movement itself, um, and then third, the reaching of the destination, and then fourth, resting in it. All right. So we've got four things. Three of them, he says, coincide with those three acts of the will that we've been discussing, love, desire, and joy. All right. So number one, the natural tendency would be love. Um, two, the movement itself would be desire and the acts that flow from it. Four, the resting in it would be delight, and so the attaining, what's that? Not the will but the intellect. That's the argument. Seems like a good argument. But there's a problem, right? And there are many problems. So one problem is it, if it's just one faculty that's essentially constituting beatitude, that seems out of harmony with the psychological analogy. And it's also out of harmony with some key principles in the Christian life, such as the primacy of charity. I'm just think of you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and many, many other texts. Right? It seems that love is rather central, not just to getting beatitude, but also the essence of it, it would seem. And it also contradicts an argument that St. Thomas himself makes when he directly poses the question of which faculty um, is more noble, the intellect or the will. And he makes this distinction. He says, the intellect is more noble, simply speaking, um, but it depends on what the object is. And so when the object is um, above us, then the will actually has a priority. And the reason is that the intellect receives into itself. Um, and so, for example, when we know God, what do we do? We reduce God because everything is received according to the mode of the receiver. And so we have to shrink God to fit him into our heads. And we shrink him rather much. But the movement of love is directed to the reality as it is. And so the impetus of love and that gift is to the real God in all his fullness. Right? So that's the primacy of charity that St. Thomas defends with regard to an object greater than themselves and above all with regard to God. Now some people have argued, many Thomists have argued that, okay, that's true in this life, right? So in this life, yes, to know God we have to shrink him. And so clearly charity has the priority in this life. 
But in beatitude, that wouldn't be the case, they argue, because in the beatitude vision, we're not tricking him. But when you think about it, who comprehends God? Only God. And so it's true we see him face to face, but we don't see him with the clarity by which he can, could be known, right? And actually, how much less there'll be grades, no? But in each case, there'll be an, a gap there that's not countable. Okay, so it seems that even in heaven, it's, the principle still applies, that it should be more noble to love him because that movement of love is to going to his full reality. Now, he actually um, argues this directly in an interesting question. It's one of these, St. Thomas very often discussing um, what seems like strange questions, comes out with great principles. So he, um, in the first part, in the, um, he poses the question about the, he's speaking about the hierarchies of angels. And he poses the question, well, why are the seraphim placed by Dionysius in the highest group and the cherubim second? Because seraph um, has, is from the um, Hebrew root of fire, whereas cherubim um, would more suggest knowledge. And so he posed the question, well, why are those angels named after the, the burning love placed higher than those named after knowing? And he gives this exact argument that we've just used. And so, but he's applying it to angels in glory. So clearly, um, it applies also to heaven, the life of heaven. Right? So it's better um, to know lower things is better than to love them. Right? Better to know, for St. Thomas, to know an apple than to love it. But for things higher than ourselves, and perhaps equal to ourselves as well, better to love them than to know. Okay. Now, I'm going to give my proposed solution to the argument that St. Thomas gave. So I think the flaw in the argument, and I do think that there is a, I mean, it works perfectly, but I think the flaw is an omission. St. Thomas doesn't consider the aspect of love of charity, or agape, in that section on the treatise on the final end. He's looking at love of concupiscence or eros for happiness. And th that makes sense. No, it's the treatise on happiness. So it would make sense that he's looking there at eros. And he does actually say in a uh, reply to one of the injections that well, he's not speaking about charity. That will be addressed later in the second part, the treatise on charity. So I think that's the, um, the problem here. Right? So it, if you're only looking at eros, love of desire, clearly love of desire is not going to constitute beatitude, but lead, lead us to getting it and then delight in resting it. His argument is perfectly correct for eros. Um, but I don't think it's correct for agape. And I think we can see that by his analogies, right? So the miser. Clearly, the example of the miser is about love of desire, eros, and not about charity or agape. And the same thing goes for local movement. Right? The analogy of local movement is precisely suited to represent love of desire or eros. Now, why is this important? Because love of desire <clears throat> moves us to the end and doesn't unite us with the end directly. But love of charity is different. Love of charity isn't just something preliminary to union, but love of charity unites in a way complementary to the way that knowing unites. In other words, we can be united and must be united by two complementary movements, receiving into ourselves and moving out from ourselves to the beloved with self-gift. And so it's the complementarity of the two operations together that must con constitute the, the fullest union between ourselves and God. Right, and I think a much better analogy than a miser would be, again, when you pick analogies for in theology, you want to pick the highest analogy. And again, I think that's the greatness of John Paul II's um, Theology of the Body is he so directly um, uses the spousal love as the best kind of analogy for understanding the love that ought to be there between us and God and heavenly beatitude. And again, there's, uh, one could say a lot about that. Um, uh, but that would be another lecture. But um, yeah, so, and St. Thomas suggests this in 
many texts on love. So St. Thomas has beautiful texts in which he speaks about love uniting, not just something preliminary to union. And it unites in, in a kind of twofold way. He says, um, love of friendship is the very union or nexus or transformation by which the lover is transformed into the beloved and in some way converted into him, converted into him by that impetus of self-gift. But it also works the other way around. Through love of friendship, the beloved is contained in the lover, right? So we carry our loved ones in our hearts by being impressed on his heart and thus becoming the object of his complacency and self-gift. On the other hand, the lover is contained in the beloved in as much as the, beloved, as the lover penetrates, so to speak, into the beloved, right? So clearly, love of friendship, especially spousal friendship, deeply unites. And the person who's expressed this, I think, by far the best, is St. John Paul II. In countless texts, so this is kind of chosen at random, from a general audience of um, December 16th, 1981, um, he says, the reciprocal gift of oneself to God, and so clearly he's talking about the act of love, right, by which we give ourselves to God, a gift in which man will concentrate and express all the energies of his own personal and at the same time psychosomatic subjectivity, will be the response to God's gift of himself to man. Right? God gives himself to us first, and we have to return the gift. This concentration of knowledge and love, right? So John Paul II is putting both, both faculties, the seeing in the vision and the returning the gift in love, cannot be anything but full participation in God's inner life. That is, in the Trinitarian reality itself. In other words, John Paul II is arguing that beatitude, heavenly beatitude, is going to mirror the Trinitarian processions. The procession of the word, seeing God in the word, right? That's what beatific vision is, is seeing the word that proceeds eternally, that is eternally generated, but not just that, giving ourselves back, and we'll see precisely in you could say, in the spirit and in the very spiration of the spirit. Right, so the, the divinization of the soul and glory will produce in us an image of the Trinity. Right? Every one of the blessed will, will bear through their operations of knowing and loving, knowing beatific knowing in the word and love, beatific loving, will bear the image of the Trinitarian life. Um, receiving the, the word in the vision and breathing forth love in the Holy Spirit um, for the Father and Son. Okay. Now I think the person who's best expressed this is, not surprisingly, a mystic, St. John of the Cross. And, um, uh, Michael Wallstein, in his um, translation, in his introduction to his translation of the man and woman, he created them, the theology of the body, he points out that um, John Paul II, um, it seems, took, well, I mean, found in St. John of the Cross this concept of self-gift. Because John Paul II wrote his um, dissertation, his, his um, theological dissertation, on faith in John of the Cross. And one of the texts that he cites there is this text here from the living flame of love. Uh, and which John of the Cross says, speaking about a soul in the mystical marriage. Right? That's the, the height of the spiritual life. Being the shadow of God through this transformation, transformation of the mystical marriage, the soul performs in this measure, in God and through God, what he through himself does in it. For the will of the two is one will, and thus God's operation and the souls are one. Right? So there's this union. Since God gives himself with a free and gracious will, so too the soul gives to God, right? So in other words, if God's giving to us, we have to give back to mirror. And here's the beauty. He adds this thing. In the vision, we receive God himself. And so when we give back through beatific love, what are we giving back? Not just our poor selves, but we're also giving back what we've received. In other words, we can give God back to God. And so he, he, and he says, and this is a true and complete gift of the soul to God. And so the soul gives to God, God himself and God, because he's been given to us, and that's a gift of self. 
And he goes on to say, the soul in beatitude is conscious that God is indeed its own and that it possesses him by inheritance with the right of ownership as his adopted child through the grace of his gift of himself. Having for him for its own, it can give him and communicate him to whomever it wishes. Who does it want to communicate him? Back to the source. Thus it gives him to its beloved who is the very God who gave himself to it. By this donation, it repays God for all it owes him since it willingly gives as much as it receives from him. Right? So what John of the Cross is describing is precisely the act of the will in beatitude, the act of the will giving back and completing the circle. And again, it presupposes you can't love what you don't know, and since in beatific vision we will know him as he is and receive him in that vision, we can, in a sense, give him back um, with ourselves. And you can see I'm going to end this with an analogy with the Eucharist but you can see it already in these texts. Yeah. And he poses a, an objection, um, and that is precisely, it seems that St. Thomas argues against this. And so he, he's aware of that he's giving a different take, a different uh, argument, and so, he's, so he defends his, his view in saying, well, the ultimate reason for everything is love. It can't not be whose property is to give and not to receive, right? So we think of Jesus' words, what, what is more blessed to to give or to receive. Um, so the will whose property is to give and not to receive, whereas the property of the intellect lies in receiving and not giving. The soul in the inebriation of love does not put first the glory she will receive from God, but rather the surrender of herself to him through true love without concern for her own profit. And then secondly, the desire to see is included in the desire to love, because you can't love what you don't know. Maybe I'll skip this. Um, right, so John of the Cross develops more at some length um, the idea that um, in this act of love, we're participating, he claims, in the spiration of the spirit in a way analogous to our participating in the generation of the word in receiving that word in the beatific vision. Right, and that makes sense, right? That would... That's what we were expecting at the beginning, that our acts and beatitude ought to mirror the two divine processions and profoundly participate in them. All right, I'd like to end this with looking at an analogy with the Eucharist. Right, in the Eucharist, we see the same dual movement. Right, in the Eucharist, God comes to us. Right, he becomes present on the altar. And then he's given, not just to us on the altar, but in our very selves. But it shouldn't end there, right? It's not just a receiving. The Mass is a sacrifice, and it is in some ways first a sacrifice, or at least no less a sacrifice than a banquet. It's both in complementary fashion, and in the sacrifice, the movement is the other way. We're giving him back, right? We're offering the whole church and each one of the faithful, offering God to God, just as John of the Cross was speaking there. God the Son to God the Father. Um, and so there's a complementary circular movement in every uh, Mass. And Lumen Gentium speaks about this in the famous text, Lumen Gentium 11, taking part in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the source and summit. Again, those very words, source and summit, we've heard so many times, speak of the dual movement. Source and um, that we receive, but sum it because we're giving back. And in that giving back, we're offering, Lumen Gentium says, the whole Christian life, the faithful offer the divine victim to God and themselves with it. Right, so that's that gift of self back. So again, the Eucharist ought, so we've got two analogies now. The soul's acts and beatitude ought to mirror the Trinitarian processions and ought to mirror the two complementary movements of the Eucharist. And we could go much further, and that, but that would be another. Um, the, um, the psychological analogy, I think, helps us to see that the tr God is the exemplar not just of unity, but of all complementarity. And Joseph Ratzinger, in his book, Introduction to Christianity, um, has, says a very profound thing about this. He says that God is not just the exemplar of unity, but of multiplicity 
through the Trinity. But I would like to say, not simply multiplicity, but above all, complementarity. Right? The two processions with their, their opposed directions are the um, exemplar of all the complementarities that make up the cosmos. And I would say intellect and will, but also male and female, maternity, paternity, Christ and the church, giving and receiving. Uh, the Trinity is the exemplar of all of this. And Rahner, um, so this has been pointed out various times, has this famous saying at the beginning of his work on the Trinity that um, in the scholastic treatment, and he's thinking, I think, of the psychological analogy, the Trinity tended to stand in, in this splendid isolation, which is a, a, um, a, an isolation from the rest of theology and creation. That's the charge. And therefore, we have to do Trinitarian theology in another way to um, bring it into contact. I don't think we need to do it another way. The psychological analogy shows us that the Trinity is the utter opposite of isolation from um, um, what we see in the cosmos, the, um, oops, all of those complementary pairs, male and female, paternity, maternity, analysis, synthesis, receiving, giving, communion, sacrifice, bridegroom and bride, Christ and the church. Thank you. This evening's response will be given by David C. Schindler, uh, who is Associate Professor of Metaphysics and Anthropology at the Pontifical John Paul II Institute on Marriage and the Family at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Obtaining his doctorate in theology from uh, the CUA in 2001 with a dissertation on the philosophy of Hans Urs von Balthasar, Professor Schindler has written widely on such topics as marriage and family life, as well as on the classical problems of reason and free will and the relationship between the true, the good, the beautiful. Uh, besides his influential study, Hans Urs von Balthasar and the Dramatic Structure of Truth, a Philosophical Investigation, the breadth of Professor Schindler's expertise is well revealed in his monographs such as The Catholicity of Reason from Erdmann's in 2013, The Perfection of Freedom, Schindler, Schelling, and Hegel Between the Ancients and the Moderns in 2012, Plato's critique, critique of impure reason on truth and goodness in the Republic, which was CUA in 2008, and hot off the press coming out in a few months uh, with Notre Dame, University of Notre Dame Press, uh, Freedom from Reality on the Diabolical Character of Modern Liberty, uh, a great title to say exactly what he wants to talk about. And then also one of the other services, besides being uh, a regular uh, editor for Communio International, he has done yeoman's work in translation, both from French and from German into English, and something that might interest all of you, uh, just completed a translation on uh, Ferdinand Ulrich's Homo Abyssus uh, out uh, in next year with Urmans, which of, of course originally in, in uh, Latin, was it? Yes, oh, it was also German. The Germans love Latin titles, okay. Um, among his many uh, talents, uh, Professor Schindler also had the good sense to marry Professor Jeannie Heffernan, which I permit myself to say since I had the privilege of witnessing and blessing that marriage. So, Professor Schindler. Is it, is there there? Can, turn maybe we can, turn this is it can I just turn the computer off? I, I'll try. There we go. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for uh, staying here to the bitter end. Here comes the caboose. It's been a, 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 a long um, and, and wonderful uh, colloquium. Um, my response was uh, to the written paper and, and uh, a, a few things have been developed and text uh, formulations are a bit different. I, I hope this is still relevant uh, uh, enough to, to make some sense, but uh, what I've written, I've written, I suppose. Um, uh, Professor Feingold has provided a much needed service in retrieving a theme of fundamental significance in Aquinas. I think we can all agree, the complementarity of intellect and will. And he reinforces Aquinas' position by retrieving yet another theme, the psychological analogy, 
as a model for interpreting the Trinity. This analogy, which he says has regrettably been marginalized um, in the theology of the last century, I think he's, he's right about that, uh, then leads him to a rather novel position regarding man's uh, final beatific condition, we might say, novel in any event uh, among Thomists, typically. Um, while somewhat notoriously uh, in some circles, um, Aquinas explicitly affirms that man's final end consists essentially in an act of intellect, uh, which is why it's a beatific vision, described as a beatific vision. Uh, Professor Feingold prevents, uh, presents texts that have tended to be overlooked in this context uh, to make a case that charity ought to be understood as a co-essential part of beatitude. And I will admit that he's uh, opened my eyes to a new dimension of, uh, of the question with uh, these texts, um, and I'm grateful to him for it. Um, but then going uh, distinctly beyond the letter of Aquinas, and, and one question to be raised is whether it goes beyond the spirit of Aquinas, um, Professor Feingold proposes that the act of intellect by which man receives a direct intuition of the divine essence in a certain sense remains unsatisfying in itself and demands of itself a further act by which man gives himself to God in return and in, in fact gives God back to God in return uh, in imitation of the procession of the Holy Spirit. This self-giving he identifies as the essential act of will uh, uh, and the essence of love. Now while I'm quite sympathetic uh, with Professor uh, Feingold's concern to uphold a deep and ultimately abiding reciprocity between intellect and will. I think that's a crucial point. And to incorporate love more deeply than's typically done into uh, beatitude. Um, and, I, and I appreciate very much this, this nuptial exchange that he described uh, very beautifully. I, I have some concerns about um, how he understands the reciprocity between intellect and will and how he understands the nature of love which I hope to sketch out very briefly here in this short uh, response. As Professor Feingold's paper makes clear, the so-called uh, psychological analogy is not psychological in the modern sense of the term, meaning more or less what goes on inside my head. Um, instead, um, uh, uh, it's psychological in the classical sense, the logos of the psyche or the human soul. Um, it is uh, the powers of the intellect and will uh, are precisely those powers by which the soul, in a certain sense, exceeds its own borders, um, so to speak, and encounters the reality of things outside of itself. The paradigm of such an encounter with an other, of course, is the soul's knowing and loving not just another thing in the world, but ultimately another person, uh, whether God or other human beings. So there's a perfectly, you might say, natural uh, uh, opening of the psychological analogy into what's sometimes called the interpersonal analogy, uh, with which the psychological analogy, I think, is too often um, problematically contrasted. And what I would wish to suggest is that a reciprocity between these two analogies is essential for a proper understanding of either one, uh, which is to say that our interpretation of each will go astray to the extent that we simply oppose uh, uh, either one to the other. On this score, I find it very interesting, as you all have uh, noted, uh, certainly, that although Professor uh, Feingold constantly referred to the psychological analogy, in fact, by the end, he was talking about the love uh, between the lover and the beloved, um, which is the interpersonal analogy. So, I, and it was natural for him to do so, um, I suggest. So, <clears throat> uh, as I said, we need, uh, uh, I think, a balance of these two analogies. Now, do we find something uh, like that in uh, Aquinas? I'm not um, an expert in Aquinas' thought, and I'm not a theologian. I, I uh, uh, work in philosophy. Uh, but it seems to me that there is a certain ambiguity in Aquinas. And uh, it's an ambiguity, I think, that can become problematic in a modern context in which the uh, nominalistic fragmentation of reality has become the very air that we breathe. Um, as Professor Feingold has explained so clearly, the, uh, the reason Aquinas privileges the psychological analogy is that the soul in its spiritual dimension, that is in its intellectual and volitional powers, represents the summit of created things. But one note, when Aquinas seeks to characterize what, he, what makes the spirit supreme, he highlights, as Professor Feingold pointed out, a single aspect. The spiritual soul is capable of a kind of action that is unique in creation, namely perfectly imminent action rather than transitive. 
Uh, and that is to say that even in their relation to another, the acts of intellect and will remain within the soul. They return to themselves in a perfect reflexivity. It is precisely this dimension that, uh, that um, Professor Feingold emphasizes. Now, the imminence is, of course, essential to the analogy, essential to the analogy since it is what enables us to preserve the simplicity of God and to avoid a variety of heresies, as, uh, as he argued. Uh, but it seems to me that what is truly unique about the spiritual powers is not only the perfect imminence of their operation, but also their perfect transcendence a transcendence that perfectly coincides with their imminence. And by transcendence, I mean this uh, step uh, outside ourselves from David Hume or ex uh, exteriority of Levinas that uh, Father uh, Schenk alluded to earlier, um, this, this capacity to move beyond, uh, beyond ourselves, this spiritual powers simultaneously reach beyond and remain within. Um, a, a beautiful text on that is the De Veritate 2, two uh, response to objection two, where uh, Aquinas says subsistent forms reach out, so the soul, the spiritual soul, reaches out, this is a quote, reach, reach at, reaches out to other things, perfecting them and influencing them, flowing into them, in such a way, however, that they still retain their imminence and self-possession. So that's, it's this twofold thing that I think makes them so interesting. Through our senses, we reach, as it were, only the surfaces of things. The sensitive power allows us to perceive the essence of a being only in and through its sensible accidents, rather than directly in itself. But in the intellectual operation, we are able to know the inner reality of a being, intus legere. Uh, to arrive beyond the necessary and good limit of our individual subjectivity, to grasp things as they are in themselves. And in our will, we are able to affirm them as such. It is good that you exist, as Joseph Pieper always said. The simultaneity of transcendence and imminence in the spiritual acts may not have been so necessary to emphasize in the Middle Ages, but it seems to me crucial in our contemporary setting in which we are beset by cultural problems of uh, cultural patterns of pure extroversion and pure introversion, in which the response to the modern uh, predicament of being trapped in our heads is answered only by the postmodern obliteration of subjectivity sim simply, an obliteration that the modern subject nevertheless continues somehow to survive like one of the living dead. <clears throat> but recognizing the simultaneity of transcendence and imminence is also crucial, I suggest, for a proper understanding of the Trinity. The necessity for the transcendent aspect of the simultaneity becomes most directly evident in the procession of the Spirit, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but it's already apparent in the procession of the Son, I think, the Logos or the Word, and the corresponding act of intellection. To be sure, Aquinas points again and again uh, to Aristotle's circle of the psychic acts to show that the act of intellect terminates in the soul. This receiving that was described repeatedly. This act is unquestionably the preeminent imminent act, but it would be improper to think of this act, I think, as merely imminent uh, for several reasons. First, going beyond Aristotle in an important respect, Aquinas specifies with Augustine that the act of intellect terminates not simply in the intellectual power as such, but in the word that proceeds. This procession, of course, remains in the intellect, at least in one respect. I'll get back to that. But the very word procession suggests a movement outward. So this taking in is also a kind of movement outward. The mo this movement stands out especially when we recognize that a word is, as Aquinas frequently says, citing Augustine, notitia cum amore, knowledge with love, explaining that the other directed movement of love, quote, this is from Aquinas, Love belongs to the notion of word. Moreover, as Professor Feingold himself observes, the word in the human soul, uh, he observed in the essay, uh, is not itself the object of knowledge, but is instead that in and through which the real thing outside the soul is known. Knowledge of things as they actually exist occurs properly in the act of judgment, an act that necessarily involves the free act of the will and by which the intellect transcends in some respect, even the ver verbum mentis that remains in it. But is this need to transcend not precisely what marks the difference between the human soul and the Trinity, since the, in the latter, the word itself is not a mere sign, but the subsistent object of knowledge? Yes, 
and, and know. It is important to recognize that what distinguishes the Trinitarian procession from human knowing is not that it is an imminent act rather than a transcending one, but that it is more, a more perfect simultaneity of both imminence and transcendence. This point becomes evident in the famous text of Summa Contra Gentiles uh, 4.11, in which Aquinas makes an argument for the divine procession of the Logos by means of a series of analogies to various processions in the created world, passing from generative reproduction of plants, plants all the way up to the spiritual act of intellection. Aquinas intends through this presentation to show the increasing imminence of these acts of procession as we proceed up the chain of being, so to speak. Uh, but as uh, Michael Higgins, a, a doctoral candidate at the Institute, has pointed out to me, a funny thing happens on the way to his conclusion. When Aquinas reaches the Trinity, after getting more and more imminent, he reintroduces biological generation to illuminate the full mystery of the procession of the word, which is indeed also the generation of the sun. Generation is a kind of transitive activity that he's appealing to. Uh, by doing so, he rather ironically returns to what he had initially posited as the most extreme form of procession, most extrinsic, rather, form of procession, to illu illuminate what is the perfection of an in imminent act. So Professor Feingold claimed in the paper that we cannot use the analogy of biological generation to understand the procession of the sun without falling into heresy, but this is uh, only true if we absolutize the interpersonal analogy. It's also the case, I submit, that we will fall into heresy if we fail to appeal to biological generation and the otherness it implies. But let us return to the will and the Holy Spirit who bears the names love and gift. Because of the brevity of time, I won't make a detailed case for the transcendence of the act of the will, even in its imminence, which I presume is much more obvious as I pointed out before, Feingold himself discusses the, well, in his paper, he didn't uh, discuss this here, but uh, the imminent uh, effect of love only in relation to friendship, um, the interpersonal relationship between the lover and the beloved. Aquinas could not be clearer that the will's operation terminates in what is other than itself in a decisive way, that it represents an outward movement uh, of the circle of the acts of soul. It's an appetite, ad petere, it's a movement towards. In this, Aquinas uh, agrees with Aristotle. It's interesting to note that this self-transcending movement is precisely why Aristotle, who arguably has his own kind of psychological analogy for God, ascribes an intellect to God, but not a will to God. Aristotle is all about imminent activity. Aquinas, by contrast, affirms a will. He recognized God as, recognizes God as love in himself and not a mere supreme object of love. And this is because the perfect unity he sees in God is a tri-unity. Uh, this makes clear the, that the imminence of the psychological analogy taken simply by itself is both indispensable and profoundly inadequate as an analogia trinitatis. Now, there seems to me uh, to be an ambiguity in Aquinas on just this point, an, an, an ambiguity, uh, which an emphasis on the interpersonal analogy would help to clarify, I think. Without it, there will be a tendency, it seems, to make self-love, uh, quote, the greatest love of all, as Whitney Houston proclaimed in the self-obsessed 1980s. Uh, this is a tendency that we discover not only in Aristotle, for whom self-love is the source and model of all love, but also it's a tendency we find in Aquinas. It's a tendency there. Second, the decision to remain with the, with the psychological analogy alone will lead one to look for the final perfection of love in its imminent effect, which entails a significant difficulty. In a text cited by Professor Feingold's paper, not in the lecture, Aquinas seems to do just this, uh, quote, and the, the wording of this is very interesting and very important. Uh, this is a quotation from Aquinas. The will is made actual not by any uh, similitude of the object willed within it, but by its having a certain inclination to the thing willed. That's actually a remarkable text. To affirm just this, if that's all you said, uh, 
uh, would be to terminate the operation in its very movement, which is to subordinate actuality in an ultimate way to potency. You see, if it terminates imminently, the only thing imminent is an inclination, and so you're having it end in something that's incomplete. Uh, and that is no doubt quite high on the Thomistic list of sins of the intellect, this confusion of act and potency. These problems can be avoided, I suggest, by integrating the psychological and interpersonal analogies, which allows us to affirm the simultaneity and indeed the interdependence of imminence and transcendence, rather than attempting to affirm one aspect precisely by downplaying the significance of the other. Professor Feingold helpfully takes a step in the direction of the interpersonal analogy, as I pointed out, uh, drawing not only on Aquinas, but even more decisively on John of the Cross, Gaudium et Spes, and John Paul II. But there are a number of points to be made about the precise way he makes this step in the, in the written paper. Professor Feingold suggests that Aquinas' argument against love as strictly essential to beatitude is valid with respect to the imperfect love of eros, but does not exclude the perfect love of agape, which is friendship. Now, leaving aside for a moment the eros-agape distinction, which I'll come back to, I wish to affirm in a fundamental way Professor Feingold's observation that friendship is perfect because it entails a real unity of wills. I think that's an essential point to be made and uh, uh, to be built on. On the other hand, however, it seems to me a more careful argument on this point would be required to justify this reading, one that would take into account the simultaneity of transcendence and imminence that I have been insisting on. To see this point, we need only ask a simple question. And I, it seems to me this is, the, this is the fundamental metaphysical question that has to be asked to justify the reading that Professor Feingold wants to give. And the question is, where, where does the principal locus of the unity of lovers lie in the order of the will? It seems to me one would have to say that it lies principally outside of the soul. Principally, not exclusively. Principally outside of the soul, following the logic of the will's operation, which is appetitive. <clears throat> but one can say this, it seems to me, only if one recognize, recognizes in a, an explicit way the real transcendence of the psychic acts. If one fails to see this, one will tend, as Aquinas appears to, and Professor Feingold, I think, with him, to reduce this unity to a mere affective union. That's, that's the, what union looks like in the individuals, but it's, it's inside. Uh, and, but that's deeply inadequate. A coincidence of interior inclinations is, to be sure, the internal fruit of unity. But it is not unity itself, nor can it be the principle of unity. Some more basic unity has to be posited as the actuality that makes the inclination possible. Aquinas' argument against love as part of the essence of happiness would apply equally to what Professor Feingold calls agape, to the extent, to the extent that this love reduces to an effective unity. If Feingold wishes to develop Aquinas in the direction of a deeper integration of love into beatitude, he would have to develop an argument for something like uh, a substantial unity outside of the lovers, beyond the, the lovers, a, a, a bond that has a kind of a substantial character. And I actually think that, that argument can be made, but it has to be made. Uh, and there's more to say about that, but we don't have the time. Let's look uh, now more directly at Professor Feingold's account of love as pure self-gift. Because he absolutizes the imminence of the intellectual act in his interpretation of Aquinas, it is not a surprise, I think, to, uh, that he finds it unsatisfying with respect to its ultimate instance, and so needs to supplement that with an act of love, which strikes me as equally unsatisfying in precisely the opposite direction. He describes this love as a purely spontaneous act in the sense that it is a giving rather than a receiving, a transcendence in a way that now doesn't include in itself a receptive imminence. So uh, there would be a lot of positive things I would want to say about his characterization. I'm not simply critical, but uh, I think I'm charged with raising some questions. So I'm just going to list uh, problems that I, I have with that very, very briefly here. Um, uh, first, Professor Feingold's contrast between eros and agape is, to my mind, deeply problematic. 
both with, res both with respect to Aquinas and with respect to right reason and basic human experience. Uh, the, the paper this morning on, on, on self-gift, I think, is a, is a response to that separation of Eros and Agape. Uh, desire and goodwill or friendship are not two separate loves, but as Aquinas uh, makes clear, they are inseparable aspects of every love. And you did say that in the lecture. It was not in the paper, but it was in the lecture. Um, Aquinas' main Christian sources, and this I think is, is important to point out, main Christian sources are, um, wow, well, uh, Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, and Dionysius the Areopagite, all of whom uh, emphatically deny any significant difference between Eros and Agape. Um, and the text that uh, uh, Aquinas uses from Dionysius uh, on which Professor Feingold uh, builds his argument, this notion of love as unity. Uh, Dionysius is arguing that um, eros uh, is, the, is, is the more adequate word uh, than agape. Um, uh, and I guess I'm running, I'm essentially out of time here, um, but I had a number of other points to make. Uh, let me just uh, say in the end, um, uh, one of the... Um, most interesting ways I think that, that this project could be developed that I think would account for some of the criticisms that I uh, wanted to make uh, would be to, in, to introduce a word that, that uh, didn't appear in the, in the lecture, and the word is uh, beauty. Uh, uh, beauty seems to, uh, to introduce a, a, a new dimension of, of complementarity between intellect and will. It uh, uh, allows a gratuitous notion of love that is not in any way um, opposed to this unity of eros and agape. And um, uh, it would, I think, enrich both our understanding of, of human existence and the Trinity. Uh, but all of that, of course, would have to be developed far further. And um, um, that's all the time that I have. So thank you very much for your attention. Time is passing uh, very quickly, uh, but we have a few minutes for some questions. So why don't I invite the two speakers to come forward up to the podium. And I don't know if there are people with the microphones or not. Yeah, okay. So back there. Yes, you. <laughs> So it's a beautiful paper. I'm in full sympathy with the overall conclusion, but I think uh, you are unfair to Aquinas in saying that his argument that love cannot be the ultimate end fails when the love is agape. And here's why I think it fails. Um, as you rightly notice, love, love has two aspects, right? It has a unitive and a benevolent aspect. Um, it has a desire for the good of the beloved and a desire for union with the beloved. Th this, and, for, for, the, for happiness, both of these desires would need to be fulfilled. Now, in the case of God, the desire for the good of the beloved is always fulfilled because God is the good in it itself. That's fine. But about union, now you present a number of beautiful texts from Thomas which say that there is union as soon as there is perfect love. But I think those, but Thomas makes a relevant distinction around, somewhere around these texts. Um, and he, that's, he distinguishes real from formal union. And what, what he's saying in these texts is that complete for, that formal union is constituted by complete love. The formal union, the, the mutual indwelling, all that is a matter of formal union. But he also has this idea of real union, which is always present in love and varies from one type of love to another. And this real union goes beyond love. So in the conjugal case, for instance, the real union is constituted by, uh, by, by becoming one body. And we can, we can see, it's a pretty clear, right, that if we have a married couple who have perfect love for one another but are separated physically and unable to consummate, they are not happy, qua married couple, because the love is not consummated. So the fulfillment of the desire for real union needs to be there. And, and the real union is not fulfilled by the love itself for Thomas. It's something beyond the love itself because it's the, it's the formal one that's fulfilled by love itself. So that means that even in agape, because this is in all kinds of love, 
there's still a kind of desire that needs to be fulfilled by something other than love itself. And it's very plausible to think in this case the real union would have to be the beatific vision. Uh, and so something is required beyond the love for happiness, the beatific vision. And it's only the consummated love that could be in it. Okay. Um, just briefly, um, I agree. So I'm not arguing that um, formal beatitude is constituted by agape love by itself, right? But the complementarity of the two together. And so I think that's exactly what we find in the analogy of spousal uh, bliss, that that union comes from knowing one's spouse and giving oneself to one's spouse together. But in the vision, we receive God, but love makes us for him, and the two together make the union. That's how I would answer that. Thank you. <laughs> in defense of our Lord's parables, in defense of our Lord's parables, especially the Gospel of Luke, I would simply point out that Thomas in his commentary, I believe it's on the unjust steward, says it is, um, it is not the lofty analogies that we make about God that are the best, that actually it's the ones that are the most clearly merely analogies, because we don't confuse the reality with the analogy. And I think that that's maybe something we should ponder as we reflect on the psychological analogy and not confuse it with the reality of the Trinity. Point well taken. I really enjoyed the paper too and learned a lot and it's well outside my area so <laughs> so my question is really basic and it's puzzlement and I'm hoping that you can just clarify really briefly for me so I'm just gonna like speak like a philosopher rather than a more theologian uh, so as I as I understand it um, uh, knowledge is logically prior to love right so uh, you can uh, you can know without loving but you can't love without knowing and also, knowledge is sort of explanatorily prior to love, so knowledge is at least a partial explanation of why you love a particular thing, but love is not a partial explanation of why you know a particular thing. You can get to know something better by loving it, <laughs> but the knowledge itself in its initial thing is not explained by the loving, as the loving is explained by what it is you know, at least in part. Given those two truths, at least they seem to me to be truths, right, aren't we absolutely forced to accept that the essence of beatitude is knowledge and that love is, can only ever be no more than a proper accident? <laughs> great, great question. Um, so yes, I would concede entirely um, the premises. Um, and, and yes, we have to say that there's a priority of the intellect in beatitude. I think that's clear. I just, there's a difference between saying there's a priority and that it's absolutely or formally constituted by that alone. And the, so um, I would want to answer by saying that um, um, the will has, um, precisely by constituting the subject for uh, making that return, that is also essential for the full union. That's how I would answer it. But absolutely, it's dependent on the intellect. And I think we can bring in here the, the um, question of beauty as well. I, I was thinking as I was giving this, he's going to speak about beauty. And, um, and sure, that also would be in the knowing. Knowing that beauty is, again, what brings forth the response of we love. Yeah. May I? Mm -hmm. Are you finished? I, yeah. I, <clears throat> I, I actually would want to raise a question about that premise, the, the, the premise. I, I don't think it is possible to know without any love whatsoever. That I, I think, I mean, one of the issues that I, in the later part of the, the paper, um, we have the taxes of the Trinity, we have to keep the order properly, but we also have to recognize a circumcession, which means that uh, we can never simply rest content with an understanding that says first this, then that, then the third. And that's true both for the in, for the Trinity and also for the cycle uh, for the 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 acts the powers of, of the soul. 
um, uh, I, I don't think it is possible uh, to come to knowledge of anything without love already being operative in some sense, uh, just as it's not possible to, to, to love it. So, I mean, the, the th think, think about this. What, what, what difference does it make if you think of the vision of the, the very vision of God in the eschaton is, is already a gift of self. We, we, we're giving ourselves in our very knowing God and it's not simply a second act that we add after having received him without any ecstatic act on our part. It seems to me that just doesn't make sense. But I will resist the temptation to jump in and just say that <laughs> there, there is a, 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 a scholar with whom I share a relationship of identity who has written on this subject. <laughs> Brother Gregory. I have a question for Professor Feingold. Uh, Professor Feingold, you mentioned that the act of love is higher than the act of the intellect because we only know partially, whereas when we love God, we, are, we love God in his, own, his entirety. But you also mentioned that um, we cannot love what we don't know. And so if we don't know God in, in his own entirety in this life and even in the beatitude, how do we understand that we are loving God in his entirety? Great question. Um, I think there's a lot of force to that. Um, and I think that's um, our uh, growth in knowing, I mean, that's precisely the reason for what we do, right? That our growth in knowing God ought to enable us to love him better. And therefore, receiving the vision of God will make possible a, a degree of charity that couldn't be had without that beatific love. So I think that does counter, um, so I don't wanna make the act of love, simply speaking, higher. I wanna defend the complementarity of the two. So we'll take two more questions because we're running out of our time here. Way back in the corner there, hand up. So I'm just looking for, from each, from Professor Feingold and Professor Schindler, a uh, reaction to two texts. So the first text is for you, Professor Feingold, and the second text will be for you, uh, Professor Schindler. Uh, so the first text I'm thinking of is uh, Premier Parr's Question 12, Article 6. Um, and uh, Thomas says that he who loves more, or she who loves more, uh, she who loves more knows more. And this is in direct reference to the beatific vision. It's exactly what he's talking about. And his point is, is that the greater a lover loves, the more they are disposed to receive the beloved. So I'd like to hear a reaction to that from you, Professor Feingold. And then I'm just going to, uh, the text then for you, Professor Schindler, after Professor Feingold is okay. from Prima Secunde, question 23. Okay. And it's in one of these rare places where St. Thomas actually defines beauty. And he defines beauty as delight in apprehension. And what's really interesting is that he immediately pivots out of a delight in sensitive apprehension into delight in an intellectual apprehension. And then he immediately says that an intellectual delight and apprehension is spiritual beauty. Now it seems to me there that if the Holy Spirit is delactatio, that is a delight and apprehension, then he is actually and coldly saying spiritual beauty. So these are my two texts to each uh, speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in that text from the um, question 12, it's Thomas explaining that um, the degree of charity with which we leave this life will determine the degree of in clarity with which we'll see God for eternity. And so yes, it's a beautiful text showing the, um, what I would call that, that circularity of intellect and will. In other words, there's a beautiful um, vital circle, we could call it, between intellect and will. In other words, the um, love motivates um, the desire to know, but it's more than that. It makes one apt to know by creating already an, a, a union, a, an effective union. And so, I mean, we, these are the, um, con, so many conversions happen through some aspect, the reasons of the heart, that 
wake one up to dispose one to be open to seeing, right? So yes, loving helps us to see. In other words, we say love is blind. Sometimes it is, but love so often opens our eyes. Um, so that's how I would answer I would, I would actually rather comment on his text too, but uh, uh, I mean, because that in a way is part of the point that I, I, I wanted to make. Um, uh, with respect to the, your mention of beauty, I mean, that's, that's exactly uh, one of the things I've been working on uh, the, last, the last year. I, uh, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced and in, in reflecting on Professor Feingold's paper has, has, has uh, deepened this conviction that um, uh, we would avoid a lot of problems if we um, reconnect love with beauty rather than with the will pr principally. Um, and, and in fact, I think there are a lot of texts in Aquinas, love, strictly speaking, love is not an act of the will in Aquinas. It's a, in the sense of a subjective genitive. It's a lack, it's an act on the will in the objective genitive sense. It's, it's the formation of the will. And so it's fundamentally receptive of a form that disposes complacentia and allows one to give oneself. But the, the act of giving oneself is not love. That's an act of the will that occurs out of love, which, is, which precedes it. And, uh, and, and, and I think you can get that receptive notion of love if you connect it with beauty according to the text that you identified. And there are a couple others um, uh, th that support this. Um, and and uh, that uh, conversion experience that he spoke is, a, is, a, is an expression of this. And, and I mean, I think, I think one can go on with that. But anyway, that's a, just a proposal. So I think we'll give uh, the last question to the always insightful Professor Stephen Long. Well, now I get to disappoint everybody. <laughs> but but uh, I, I, wanted, I wanted to uh, make a small comment and then invite a uh, common response that uh, Professor Feingold, uh, and I, I, I believe uh, Dr. Schindler would, would concur with this, uh, uh, speaks of the necessity for the, the motion of intellect and will in the creature in in the beatific vision to, as it were, model the uh, Trinitarian circle, as it were, if I understand properly. But it, it seems to me that there are uh, possibly grounds for arguing that this is, in certain respects, necessarily impossible because of the poverty of the creature by comparison with the infinite fecundity of God. And by reason of the sweet, generous character of person in the Trinity. Now, the person in the Trinity, uh, when we speak of persons here, each of us has uh, distinct intellects and wills. Your mind is not my mind. Your will is not my will. If you're really irritated by this question, it certainly isn't my will. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we're at, but how many intellects and wills are there in God? There's one intellect. There's one will. And, and the difficulty of the language of donation of self here, uh, which has many fecund uses, I mean, I'm far from wanting to deny the importance, the, the helpfulness of this, but it seems to me that, that the sweet, generous simplicity and transcendence of God imposes a stark limit. And, and so there, there is perhaps a reason why it would be the case that, our, that, that as we are we receive with a poverty before we receive in, the, in a perfective, right? I mean, to receive perfectively for us is first to be poor. That's not true in God. The Son does not receive the Godhead as though he were first in poverty. And I, I think there's a danger of losing some of these distinctions with the language of the gift of self-love. I think that, that uh, it, there's a danger in confusing the relational personhood in God with uh, persons who are persons because they're substances of a rational nature. Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I would say that, um, to, to my mind, the, the, the beauty of the notion of self-gift is that it does seem to be 
a notion that can be analogously applied to God's richness as well as to our poverty. In other words, it doesn't imply a limitation and thus it doesn't seem that it would be a notion that, whereas Eros would, right? A love of, of Eros um, in God would seem to imply a limitation. Whereas that fullness of donation be, between the Father and the Son doesn't seem to um, be out of keeping with the, the divine simplicity and fullness. And I think it also can be applied to us. And um, we, of course, are always going to um, have Eros together with Agape um, because of our poverty. But God, I mean, the beauty of his gift is that he gives us so that we can give back and thus mirror that. That's how I would answer. Um, and I mean, and I, 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 to do that, though, you'd also have to talk about the son receiving the father's gift. And I think that's part of the point that you were asking there. I, as far as that dimension of the analogy, I, I mean, what, what you say is absolutely true. And, and, and in uh, speaking of the tri Trinity, it's uh, one always needs to uh, remain attentive to the mystery and, and, and keep silence. Um, uh, when when uh, appropriate um, but that that's 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 a there's a there's a danger in in uh, um, uh, how we keep vigilance one, one one is as you say we're many minds here and so we think okay actually then because God is simple it's best just to look at one mind rather than the many you see what I mean what we do is we, we oppose uh, um, we, we see that div diversity is, a, is, a, is an expression of, 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 of our imp imperfection, and so we take away the diversity in order, uh, uh, at the created level in order to, to get closer to what we think is going to be an, uh, an analogy for God. But uh, Aquinas is clear, diversity is itself an expression of the unity of God, of the perfect, the, the perfect simplicity of God is better expressed in all of our minds here together than it is in one mind. And it, when, when, you, when you turn the tables like that, the, the whole question gets, it seems to me, far more interesting. Then you, uh, that requires us to, to, to uh, uh, not rush to judgment uh, about what we consider perfections and imperfections or possible perfections and imperfections in God, um, but uh, acknowledging in human experience the, the, the kinds of things that we recognize as a true perfection. So my, my awaiting a gift from another um, uh, and, and in a way, receiving from the other can be the most profound way of, ge of being generous to the, to the, to the other person. Uh, we can all think of examples of it. If that's true, and, th if that, and, and in this way, this receiving is, is even more of a perfection than the giving, then um, it, it seems to me not uh, 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 inappropriate to consider that that perfection would somehow have to exist in God without any of the in, uh, attendant imperfections. So we don't deny that movement from potency to act in the creature. We only deny that uh, simply as, uh, 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 uh. anyway, this is an old argument, of course, and I don't wanna go on, make it any older, so. <laughs> so an essential character of Christian agape is to show our gratitude. So let's show our gratitude. <laughs>